Okay, now that we've got most of the mathematical and computational background out of the way, let's get on to some applications in quantum cognition. So, in quantum uh, cognition, the, the quantum methods were first adopted because there are problems in uh, behavioral economics which are not easily handled using uh, classical logic, and it's, it's easier to um, address them using quantum methods because you can use uh, features such as interference and entanglement. So in quantum cognition we're going to be measuring, uh, modeling mental states using what amount of qubits. So you can imagine if we started off with an initialized qubit and then we're going to act on it by a gate which puts it into a certain state and then we're going to measure. So our state might look something like this. So um, the probability of measuring a zero will be cosine squared theta, and the probability of measuring one will be sine squared theta. And here, zero or one could represent, for example, um, different outcomes or a decision. So one of the first applications of quantum cognition was to the order effect. And this, is, this refers to the phenomena seen with surveys where uh, the response to questions depends very much on the uh, order in which the questions are asked. And there was uh, one example was a survey done back in the 90s of whether Clinton and Gore uh, were trustworthy, and it turned out that the answer was sensitive to the order of the questions. Um, and this can be modeled using the uh, quantum formal formalism. So here we've got uh, our main axes, the horizontal and vertical axes, correspond to the kind of frame for addressing the Clinton question. And then the Gore axes, the dashed lines, are at an angle to that. And so what you see is that our state here, so this is a, about 40 degrees, so it's kind of roughly equally balanced between in the Clinton axis um, for saying yes or no. And so let's say that uh, the response to the question is yes, Clinton is trustworthy. So that is then used as the starting point for the next question about Gore. And then we, we get one endpoint here. But if the order of the question is reversed, what you see is you project first onto the Gore, sorry, Gore axis like that, and then onto the Clinton axis, and you get something, a, a sort of a different final probability. And the result, the, the reason for this result is that there's kind of an interference caused by a, a shift in the mental frame. So if we go through the exercise of calculating all the different probabilities for the case where it's Clinton and then Gore, we find uh, the table of probabilities looks like this. And it's actually the same. It's equivalent to what we get if we use this circuit here. So. This, so here we've got um, a rotation gate which rotates by theta, so that's kind of preparing our state. And we've got a second qubit here which is rotating by this angle phi, which um, uh, represents this shift in mental frame. The uh, first question is acting as a control on the result of the second question, and that gives exactly the same table of probabilities. So the, the quantum model was, uh, for this survey, uh, this order effect was very successful because it accurate, accurately predicts symmetries in response to survey questions. So if you look at uh, how many people vote yes to each or no to each and, and so on, there are certain symmetries which are there in the data which were picked up uh, very well by the quantum model. Um, but more generally, this same circuit can be used to simulate any decision B which is influenced by context A. So some examples include preference reversal, where we change our mind depending on the context, um, the endowment effect, where we value something more if we own it than if we don't own it, and the disjunction effect. So the disjunction effect goes back um, to this experiment from Tversky and Shafir. That, so they asked students to uh, perform a kind of an experiment. They were told to imagine that they have a tough exam coming up and they have an opportunity to buy a vacation to Hawaii at a very good price. Would they take the offer? So in one version of the test, they were told the result of the exam. If the result was passed, 
54% chose to buy. If the result was fail, 50% chose to, 57% chose to buy. So in each case, more than half. But then there is another version in which they were told they will not know the result. And in this case, only 32% chose to buy, which is, which is odd when you think about it, because the outcomes can only be pass or fail. So you'd expect it to be kind of like the average, about 55.5%. But no, only 32% chose to buy. So this is an example of some kind of mental interference effect. So one way to model this uh, using the quantum method is to is is like this. So this is a little bit like the um, kind of dual slit experiment in in physics, where you kind of imagine that you've got like a uh, a, a so, sort of a light source over here which gets split into two channels and forms an interference pattern. So in this case, what we've got is uh, something that prepares us into state for the test. We take the test. We can either pass A plus or we can fail A minus. If we pass, we go through this route up at the top, which so we have this um, decision to buy a vacation. And again, it can either split to B plus A plus or B minus A plus. Um, and then we have another two outcomes here for the case where we failed that test and we can get the probabilities for all this. And it, again, it turns out that this circuit here is equivalent. So this actually gives the same results. So this is kind of like a one qubit input version which with measurement at two different stages. This is a two qubit version where the test is acting as a control on our final decision. So in, in general, we can assume that a represents uh, some kind of a subjective context, and uh, B represents an ob objective term such as a numerical payoff. So B, uh, and then you know another kind of application of this. And then if we were to rate the overall attractiveness of uh, different possibilities on a scale to zero or one, and assume that we don't know too much about this subjective context, so we assume a uniform prior for the various probability terms then it's easily seen that the interference between the subjective and the objective factors has an expected value equal to about a, a quarter. And this was shown by Yukolov and Sornet using uh, their version of this quantum cognition, which is called quantum decision theory. And in the case of the disjunction effect, the interference is negative. So if the person knows the outcome, more than half by the vacation, so average 55%. But if they are uncertain, this reduces to 32%, which is a reduction of 23%, or about a quarter. So again, we can model all of this using our, uh, our all-purpose circuit down here. So another application of uh, quantum cognition is to, is to debt, because when you, when you think about it, if uh, a debt relationship is between a creditor and a debtor, and so the state of the debt depends on whether or not the, um, the, the debtor is going to default or not. Like if the, if the debtor is going to default, that debt is worth nothing. Uh, if the debtor is not going to default for sure, then that, that debt is, is worth its face value. So uh, as an early example of a debt-based form of money was the uh, tallies, which were used in medieval England. In the, in the Middle Ages, and uh, this consisted of, uh, so what, what would happen is to say that a sovereign wanted to collect a debt for, uh, like a tax debt for a certain amount of money. So what, what uh, they would do is uh, prepare a stick and mark it with the, the value of the debt and then split it down the middle. And the sovereign would keep the, the longer version of the stick, which was called the, the stock, and they would hand the debtor the shorter uh, piece of wood, which was the foil. And um, and then when the debt was repaid in the form of produce or whatever, then the two sides of the stick were matched and destroyed to extinguish the debt. Um, so we, we can model this using a um, quantum circuit. So, so I'm going to have uh, two initialized qubits coming in here on the left, zero and zero. We've got a not gate here, which flips the first qubit. So this is just to symbolize the uh, creation of a debt. Um, for the the debtor, I'm going to use the Hadamard gate just for simplicity, which puts it into 
a 50-50 chance of 0 or 1. And that, the stone's going to act as the control. So we've got a, a, a C0 gate here with the, the debtor acting as a control. And that's going to flip the upper qubit. And then the outcomes are this thing here. And so this is entangled. So what this means is that the debt has a value of um, it, it's it's either it's either in the state one zero or zero one, which means like one of these people is going to have the money, the debtor or the creditor, with a fifty percent chance. And uh, and this is this is important because these tally sticks uh, were originally they just formed a debt, but then because the stock represented a claim on a debt, that meant that they could they had monetary value and they could uh, circulate as money objects. So, uh, in, in other words, this kind of what we think of as sort of a cognition uh, phenomenon actually underpins the value of money. That that decision on whether to default or not is ultimately what uh, creates the value for money. And on the part of the sovereign, uh, their job is to convince that person that they must not default on the debt. And as we'll discuss later, that involves a certain kind of a word or kind of energy, which is really what forms the, the basis for money. Um, okay, so this this quantum circuit, uh, just as a note, if we look at this uh, rather complicated thing over here, we see it consists of lots of little circuits like this, which are the same thing where we've got like uh, two qubits and we've got um, gates acting on each one and then a C naught gate which is uh, entangling them and so this is not for quantum cognition as such it's actually for a genetic algorithm used in a quantum machine learning algorithm so it's just interesting to see that these the kind of the, uh, the, the the basics the core of quantum cognition are appearing in the core of quantum machine lear learning algorithms